where the overnight freeze is apparently gone, but the house still gets cold. Welcome back to another Garden Teen edition of Liquid Gold here on We Own This Town, weownthistown.net. This is Liquid Gold, a podcast about beverage, about all the things you put in your glass. This is a series that we are doing on the feed while we're all quarantined to our houses. Well, some of us are, most of us are. And there's plenty of work to be done out in the garden, so that's what we're talking about. My name's Mike Wolf, here with you once again, and we'll be checking in with my co-host, Mr. Kenneth Dedman, traveling the wild Texas West and filing reports along the way, so look forward to talking to him. Today, our topic on the show is flowers, pollinators, flowers you can use in beverage form, but also flowers that are really nice for your garden and round things out both visually aesthetically and functionally and we're going to talk about pollinator plants and all that they can do they play as big of a role as sunlight and nutrients in our garden so it's important to have flowers on the mind as we start a garden and we look to the garden to provide some solace from what we're all going through at this point, which is just a historic period of maybe inactivity, but also um, a togetherness that we are all kind of in this together. And I feel like that has really started to take hold at least somewhat. Thanks for joining us. We've had a lot of really nice feedback from listeners who have been enjoying this kind of uh, detour that we've been taking, but we're still here for you here to provide you with some some content as far as what you can drink what you can put in your glass some ideas for your drinking pantry and maybe a little cooking advice along the way as well as we get into the garden and all its wonders i must throw a shout out to jess matchin our wonderful uh, graphic artist here at liquid gold artist supreme She did the Liquid Gold logo as well as all kinds of cool artwork that's on our Instagram at Liquid Gold underscore pod on Instagram. She is at Jess underscore Matchin on Instagram and she has a new Garden Teen logo for us and we're hoping to do some merch with that. So so we'll have some updates on that on future episodes. But thank you so much to Jess. Want to throw a shout out to producer Michael Eads as always from We Own This Town producing all this cool content. There's a new San Dimas uh, detour where they're talking about Fast and Furious. That has been really cool. And also want to throw a shout out to our sponsors who have helped out along the way. Everybody from Wild Roots Vodka, Wild Roots Spirits out in Oregon, and Golden Moon Distillery in Golden, Colorado, which I hold near and dear to my heart. Let's see if, uh, is Kenneth going to check in? Kenneth is going to check in soon. So we'll get back to him. Now today, we're talking about flowers and why they're incredible and why you need them in your gardening arsenal and in your life in general. Um, Honeysuckle is something that we're going to focus on because it is bursting everywhere right now and flowering and all the rain that we're going to have and that we've had has contributed to all this beautiful honeysuckle out there. So I'll have a little excerpt from the book, uh, my book, Garden to Glass, Grow Your Drinks from the Ground Up, out on Turner Publishing now. It's on bookshop.org, and you can also help out local bookstores here in Nashville, The Bookshop in East Nashville, and Parnassus Books, who have been amazing with their support as well. You can support your local bookstores and buy books on bookshop.org, but some of these local bookstores are also offering online ordering and picking up the shop. So check out their websites for all that. And thank you to Turner Publishing for just doing an amazing job with the just the packaging. The cover of the book is just beautiful. Bryce McLeod did an amazing job. I'll have an excerpt from that later. But Honeysuckle is just incredible when we talk about liqueurs and, and infusing. The Honeysuckle flowers are so amazing for infusing. They're amazing for cordials, egg white drinks as a kind of decoration on top, and an aromatic accent. And it's a, it's a great pollinator plant to have around around your garden. So if you have it now and it's blooming around your garden, uh, you're blessed for that. Pollination. Why is it so important? Why should we care? Um, there's a great resource for gardeners out there, forest service, 
It's fs.fed.us, and there's some great free resources on there. There's a native plant and pollinator gardening guide on there that is just great and totally free to just get online and check out. That's fs.fed.us. Pollination. What is pollination? Why is it so important? Pollination is the process of moving pollen from one flower to another of the same species, which produces fertile seeds. Almost all flowering plants need to be pollinated. While some plants are pollinated by wind or water, and some are even self-pollinating, most flowering plants depend on bees, butterflies, and other animals for pollination. So that's that's really why you need these pollinators in your garden. They're going to help everything grow. They're going to help things mature. You're helping the earth. You're part of that whole ecosystem that we're all part of when you are going down this road of having a garden, planting things. You want to see them produce. You want to see them be all they can be. And on fs.fed.us, they get into all these different pollinators you can plant, all these different kinds of bees you want to be watching out for, and what kinds of flowers will attract which kinds of bees to your garden. They also mention... Which, uh, which we're doing this year in the garden. We had this mason bee house, which you can, it's basically like a little, like, like a little half birdhouse with a bunch of little straws, wooden straws injected into the middle of them and then nailed up against a fence post. It attracts all these different bees, which will help out your garden. And some of the flowers and plants that we're going to talk about today Great pollinator plants for your garden and also plants you can use in the application of beverages. Borage. Borage is an incredible plant that we're going to talk about today. Marigold and calendula, which I've also heard calendula. I don't know uh, where, where we stand there. But marigolds, all these different kinds of marigolds you can plant. Bee balm is another amazing one. All kinds of different basils really attract a lot of different bees. They love that nectar, the different basil flowers, the Genovese and the African blue basil, especially lemon basil, lime basil. There's some amazing different varieties out there of basils. Obviously, you have sunflowers, zinnias. Zinnias are some of the easiest flowers to grow, and you can use them to decorate different desserts, pastry items, drinks. Zinnias are really easy to grow and a lot of fun. That's what uh, my daughter and I have been planting recently, planting seeds of zinnia and and watch them come up. It's a lot of fun. And mint. So mint produces all these amazing, a lot of times purple and pink flowers. So having some mint around, I have Tennessee mountain mint, which goes crazy every year. And the flowers are enormous and it attracts Tons of different pollinators to the garden when it flowers in late July and early August. Also, a, a really important time to have these pollinators around. Oh, important to note here bean blossoms that you can use in all these different ways. Scarlet runner beans being the one that uh, we're going to talk about today. Scarlet runner beans are just incredible to grow along fences and along trellises. They will climb all over the place and be very prolific, and they produce these beautiful red scarlet flowers that are just incredible in salads and incredible in drinks. And yes, you can also let the beans mature and they are this incredible purple and black, spotted purple and black color that is just phenomenal. So scarlet runner beans are a lot of fun if you're looking for a a plant that will go up a trellis that will go around a fence that will produce all these beautiful blossoms that you can use and also uh, the beans themselves which speak for themselves beans also being a, a key nitrogen regulator that you can have in your garden so that is important to note as well elderberry is uh is one that you can grow i've got some elderberry in my garden this year i've been nursing an elderberry plant back to life for a friend of mine who Moved to the mountains of North Carolina. Shout out, Nikayla, if you're out there listening. Love to hear from you Um, and what you're doing with your garden up there in the mountains. Some other blossoms to be thinking of in this time of uh, getting your garden going, planning it out, adding things to it as the danger of frost is past. Cucumber and squash blossoms are just 
incredible. It's an example of an item that you can grow in your garden that is really hard to find at farmer's markets. Obviously, cucumber blossoms, you never really see those, but they are incredible in beverage form and for decorations, for garnishes, but also to use those blossoms for the flavor, which tastes like, it won't shock you to know, it tastes like a cucumber flower. It's amazing. Uh, Squash blossoms also common in certain Mexican cuisines and Italian cuisines and are just an amazing flavor that those can be expensive when you're finding them at farmer's markets, really easy to grow. And while squash, easy to find at most farmer's markets and around um, and is great homegrown, but the blossoms really hard to come by. And that's something to think about cucumber and squash blossoms. We mentioned the bean blossoms, uh, parsley and other herbs, like we mentioned the mint and basil, but parsley is an amazing one. When it flowers, those flowers are so beautiful, so intensely flavored, yet light. Um, So that's another one. Cilantro is an amazing one where you have the flavor of the cilantro seed or coriander. Cilantro, the herb, which we all know and that goes in all our tacos and can be used in a lot of different Mexican foods. And the blossoms for cilantro, which you might only be able to experience if you grew cilantro, um, those are amazing as well. So we'll come back around to talk about some of these things. In the meantime, before we get into all that, we're going to check in with our man with the West Texas Blues. All right, as promised, on the line, Liquid Gold co-host and partner in crime, traveling with the West Texas Blues and the West Texas Wide Open Skies, Southern Texas, wherever you are. We don't have to mention it, but Kenneth, how are you, my friend? Good to hear from you. Hey, Mike. What's up, my brother? Thanks, man. Oh, not much. Doing good out here. Getting cooked. Getting cooked by the sun. Yeah, it's like coming on summer down there, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was a cold spell, a couple of rainy days, but uh, the locals say from a safe distance that... uh, this is nothing compared to the summer, but right now it's 90 degrees, humid, right around 11 to 1 o'clock. The sun is straight up and down. It's pretty intense, so I couldn't imagine what it's what it's like June, July, at least. I know it in passing, but not not on the daily. Yeah, and you've got a bunch of deer out there by, by where you're at, where you're camping out? Oh, yeah. We're staying on, uh, we're camping out on a... Um, uh, Livestock farm, it's it's pretty crazy. Any given any any given moment during the day, a herd of cattle will just come through grazing, kick shit over. Um, same for deer. There's there's hundreds of deer out here. There's probably about as many deer as there are cattle. We were feeding them some uh, leftover corn cobs earlier tonight. Some asparagus. They went nuts for it. Are the dogs having fun with the deer? Oh, they don't. They're not having it. They're out to ruin their party. Yeah. They're, they don't want those beautiful, they're, they're graceful animals like hanging out by your campsite, looking all no. graceful and beautiful. Yeah. Hell no. Hell they're no. not having that. Well, it's a thrill you, when you're a dog and you know a deer is considerably larger and it's going to run away from you most of the time. God forbid, God forbid a dog ever got kicked by one. They'd never do it again, but... All the plant life, because the plant, all the plant life kind of grow one direction, straight at the sun. So there's a lot of straight lines in nature out here. Very cool. We're talking about flowers today, and you had a really fascinating experience recently with pomegranate flowers. You were face to face with pomegranate blossoms. Um, that had to be pretty cool. That was kind of a first for you, I believe. It was a first for me seeing those. Not really in the flesh, but as close to in the flesh as possible through solid cell phone photos. Um, But yeah, so you were out near some pomegranate growing. That that, that was pretty cool. We got off the road from uh, Arkansas, and we hadn't showered in about five days. And we went ahead and got this Airbnb that had all these crazy, crazy plants growing around it. I mean, like... uh, there, there were a bunch of bread seed poppies and uh, a shitload of asparagus growing out there. But then I started finding all these, all these other plants that were uh, basically from from Asia, kind of like a like a I, I believe a pomegranate's from uh, originally maybe like Iran. 
That sounds Check right. Facts on that. Um, I think it was originally portrayed by the Persians. But yeah, the, the sounds great to me. Blooming. The bulbs, the bulbs were mostly prepubescent. I don't know, like if that's the right word. Is that the right word? I just wanted to throw something sexual in there, man. <laughs> Well, the the judges say yes. We're gonna take it. <laughs> um, I imagine in another week or two it'll be flowering a lot more. But there were plenty of flowers on it. I, I gobbled a bunch up. It was growing actually right next to a mulberry tree. So oh my god, it was a, it was a ridiculously easy cocktail. To Clash build. of cultures. Yeah, so I was just grabbing the darkest mulberries off the tree and mashing it up. With pomegranate flour and uh, using some delicious, dude, I, I've been making spritzers out of uh, Texas Hill Country Sauvignon Blancs. They're really cheap out here. There's nothing but wineries out here. If there's not a livestock farm, it's a winery or an orchard. There's there's a bazillion of them out here. It's wow. crazy. Ducks. You were right on about the pomegranate. Yeah, uh, originated in the region extending from Iran to northern India been cultivated since ancient times throughout the Mediterranean region, introduced into Spanish America in the late 16th century and into California by Spanish settlers in 1769, uh, which, what was that, 250 years ago? Which I can segue into... 17 what? 1769. One thing I can say about anything being 250 years old... There's a huge oak tree, two houses down in my neighborhood. This is one of the biggest trees in the entire neighborhood. We always marvel at it, walking by and really looking up at it. And finally talked to my neighbor about it the other day. I was like, this tree is so enormous. Do you know how old it is? And he was like, well, there's this guy, Pete. He's a, a firefighter and tree nerd in the neighborhood. And he has studied the tree, claims it is 250 years old. Going, you, you'll ever really know until you chop it down. So. Yeah, until it falls over. <laughs> um, so yeah, pomegranate. Fascinating cocktail ingredient. That's very unique. You got to experience the flowers recently. It's the flower episode, Garden Teened. The flower was pretty amazing. It wasn't. It didn't have any of those pomegranate like sour notes it was actually kind of like a really light rose petal orange peel thing going to it but Ooh. light on both both ends because it's a really big blossom so it's it's not necessarily a very pungent blossom which which was really great it had a really great mouthfeel as well i don't know if they will grow in tennessee i imagine if you find some way to rig some sort of mylar contraption to increase the sunlight for them or, or i guess you could grow them under leds but what a great plant it's a huge bush it, it's a it was a sh- used as a shade bush in this on this little airbnb cottage um it's just rando growing up the side of the building like, really well straight up like i said texas straight up towards the sun the midday sun all right so borage let's talk borage borage yeah. an amazing pollinator plant Incredible in salads. The flowers taste like cucumber. Uh, some have used it in classic Pim's cups. It's fuzzy. It's really hard to eat because the leaves are a little prickly. You kind of want to cook them down. Amazing lemonade ingredient. Yeah. What do you like about borage? I, I, what kinds of luck have for, you had with it? Well, it's bright. It's great for uh, daytime cocktails. I, I think it's perfect for su- like it needs sunlight to grow, but it also needs the cocktail. Any sort of cocktail that you make with it needs sunlight as well. I, th- I like I like do- using it as a shrub. Actually, I think it was Socrates that used it as a uh, health tonic. He drank it every morning. Amazing. Someone said that that the based on toxicity, it's not good to drink borage daily. I think like the toxicity levels are ridiculous. Like you have to eat like an entire plant every, every day. day. Yep. Yeah. Which you're not going to do. And for the most part, like people people just use the the flowers for the most part, and uh, bees love it. So if you grow oh, a few yeah. large borage plants in your garden, you're going to notice. I've noticed before where I've had a few borage plants, and then I've even had like maybe some dill nearby, some beans, some basil. The bees will go to the borage. They absolutely flip 
for that yeah. taste. Must be the sweetness, you know? Uh, yeah, they, they seem to get really high, but they're really probably just really excited when they find it. <laughs> yeah, they, they they have that short-term memory. They're like, I'm going to go back to this one. I haven't been to that one. I'm going to go back to this one. I haven't been to that one yet. And they just keep going back and forth. It's the same with hum- hummingbirds. If, you, uh, if you're lucky to be up that early in the morning, like right before sunrise and into the first 45 minutes of sunrise when a lot of hummingbirds are feeding they really they they really dig porridge as well they usually get try to get there always before before the bees get out but i found like anything red or in or that contains anything in the red spectrum i think i feel like there's a little red in the porridge flower they're more like purple flowers don't you think mike yeah they're kind of purple sky blue um those are all Not colors those. that bees love and pollinators love. They love the blues, the purples, the pinks, the reds. Um, you want to talk about red? So I mentioned earlier before I called you on the show that one thing to talk about today, scarlet runner beans and the scarlet runner bean blossom, which is red, which is this bright red. Hummingbirds love it. It grows all over trellises. And a lot of times people just grow that for the blossoms to use in salads, to use in dishes, to use in as a garnish, um, and in flower arrangements too. Because the bean itself is kind of like a lima bean where it's pretty large. It's super pretty. You have to cook it and really coax it to tenderness. Perfect for uh, if you need a red blossom in your garden, if you want to attract more hummingbirds, and if you have a trellis that you want to grow something over, all those things, scarlet runner beans, perfect for that. What other plants might you know of, Kenneth, for attracting like hummingbirds? Salvia, salvia, salvia of any any color. Um, oh yeah, is is one of the it's one of the premier hummingbird and bee varietals. I, I think garden wise, a variety of anything really is really gonna um, get your pollinators moving. Um, not just not just. Uh, We'll say like one type of uh, marigold, but multiple colors of marigolds. But yeah, salvia salvia is really great in that in that respect, and also falls into my little hummingbird thing that I got. And I'm just realizing I have an obsession of. They're amazing um, to watch, like flutter around, fly around your garden. It's it's incredible how fast they can go, and it yeah. is. It's a lot yeah. of fun to have those things around. Like nature's little drones. <laughs> yep. Uh, no, salvia is really cool because it grows straight up. It doesn't really bush out too much, um, so it doesn't take a lot of space in your garden. You can grow it up the perimeter of your garden, right next to your, say, like your house, and uh, it'll it'll thrive. And like I said, it doesn't it doesn't take up too much space. It doesn't really oh, it doesn't dude. really want to bother you too much. It doesn't need uh, a lot of water either. Another one like that that's kind of obscure, but would be really cool for our friends out there who love chartreuse. I feel like most of our listeners love chartreuse. Yeah. Uh, mullen. So mullen, very common as like a weed growing alongside the road, uh, growing in on highways and stuff. It loves disturbed soils. It loves neglected soils. It's super tough. But again, it was a, a plant used by Socrates and all those homies. That should be like a feature now on Garden Teen is like, Socrates and his homies. That's not bad. Plants that they were messing around with, but Mullen, long time, uh, long time rumored ingredient for chartreuse, and I'm growing it for the first time this this year. Transplanted a Mullen plant from a neighbor who had it growing up a crack in their street, a crack in their driveway. So I feel like one of the one of the problems I'm having now is that I have um, some garden soil that's been tended to, taken care of, whatever, and I think it's been a little bit weird for the mullen plant. You know, it's kind of like too much moisture. Sure. So anyway, so you're going to be checking in with a little booze news later. Yeah, sure will. Got some, got some dope ones for you. All right, man. We look forward to it. It's good to talk to you. What else you got? Anything else? Um, yeah, yeah. A, a warning about flowers, y'all. Okay, you got a warning about flowers. Yes. Okay. Yes. Say your sweetheart gives you 
a bouquet of flowers, uh, say they're roses from your local florist, God bless them. Don't turn around and put that in a cocktail. Um, most florists are using chemical preservatives on these flowers. To Definitely make them last. great point. So, um, Really, um, if you're going to be using flowers for your home cocktails, do it in your garden. Don't cheat because a lot of these flowers that you're going to get out there in the world are uh, are possibly treated. Even the ones in your yard, make sure that they haven't been sprayed with pesticides or at risk for it as well. Good call. Appreciate the wisdom. Thanks, bud. And uh, we'll catch up with you later on Booze News. Mr. Kenneth uh, Edmond. Checking in from Thank Texas. You. Cheerio. Love you, brother. Love you too, Mike. You hang in there. We look forward to having you back in Nashville soon. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. All right, we'll see you on Booze News coming up here in just a few. All right, lovely to talk to Kenneth as always here on Liquid Gold, Garden Teen, the new series. We're in episode three, Flowers and Why We Love Them. We talked a little bit about Marigold's. And the benefits of having marigolds in your garden, great for bugs, attracting beneficial insects to your garden, attracting bees. Marigolds are great for that. There's Mexican marigolds, which you can find those seeds. And all these are really easy to grow. Important to note, you want to find marigolds that were not grown or not sold at the big box stores. You want to grow them from seed yourself. Get them from a small nursery if you need to. Because a lot of the ones that you'll see at big box stores have been sprayed with pesticides and have pesticides running through the roots there. So you don't want those. Marigolds will protect your tomatoes. They can really help with uh, slugs, tomato hornworms, other garden pests like that. French marigolds being kind of the predominant one we're talking about here with a lot of these companion planting applications. It's known as a companion plant to bush beans, potatoes, Chinese cabbage, broccoli, squash, eggplant, as well as kale. It'll help deter beetles, slug leaf hoppers, bean beetles, and hornworms as well. They add color, obviously. So much color to the garden with those orange and yellow hues, some bright reds. Um, They're super hardy. And you can make a lot of very amazing salves and oils with them. Our friends at White Squirrel Farms do amazing things with marigolds and making salves and oils that are just incredible. So check out their stuff there on Instagram, at White Squirrel Farm. But that's an easy one to grow that's very beneficial for your garden. If you're going to just pick one to two flowers, one of them should be marigolds to spread around your garden. Get some of those seeds. Very easy to grow. And uh, they might even go to seed and come back the next year as a fallen angel that you hadn't even planted. Um, Fallen angels, something we'll talk about on a future episode. So that's marigolds. Uh, Bee balms, another one to check out. Bee balms, super easy to grow. A lot of fun to grow because once it comes to that beautiful blossom, the bees just flip out for it. And it's kind of a showstopper if you can use it as a cocktail garnish. Um, You can make leaves from the tea that are just incredible. So bee balm is another one. Highly recommend you checking that one out. Zinnias are very, very easy as well to grow from seed. That's one that you just plant, you know, about a half inch into the ground. You can kind of scatter them into the ground, thin them out. They start to come up. They look like little clovers. And for first time or young gardeners, it's a lot of fun. My daughter, I always get her into planting zinnias because it's really easy to just plant them in the dirt, watch them come up in uh, four to five days to a week. And zinnias are edible and can be used as decoration and garnish. So that's another good one. We talked about bean blossoms with Kenneth, cucumber, and squash blossoms. One method for squash blossoms that I want to mention, a lot of people know about this one, but it's a classic Italian method. So mascarpone cheese being this incredible sort of secret ingredient that goes into a lot of Italian dishes, a lot of savory applications with it. It's a little bit like 
It's like if cheese were butter. That's pretty much what mascarpone cheese is. But so you take a squash blossom that you just picked in the garden, you wash it, set it on a paper towel, let some bugs flow out of it, or just let it dry. You take the blossom and you fill it up with mascarpone cheese and then fry it in a pan with a little bit of oil. And it's this incredible appetizer, a squash blossom filled with mascarpone cheese. Incredible, delectable, little garden treat there. Do not sleep on the squash blossoms. Now we're going to go down Exert Alley and read a little bit from the book, Garden of Glass. It's one of the things that really, you know, this is my way of doing a book tour for now. A lot of my book tour events got called off. So we're going to read a little bit about Honeysuckle. And I've got a honeysuckle liqueur recipe here in the book. I do love my friends at Cathead Distillery. Their Cathead Honeysuckle Vodka I've used a lot and talk about in the book as well. It's in my honeysuckle liqueur recipe in the book. I'll get to that in just a second. This is from Chapter 2, Rhubarb Redbud and the Spring Bling. Another essential wild botanical for use in cocktails and beverages is Japanese honeysuckle which grows abundantly all over the United States in all but seven states. In the house where I dug my first large-scale garden, I used to joke that nature was looking down on me and laughing as I waited for herbs, flowers, and vegetables to come to life. I had rushes of honeysuckle growing all over the backyard that seemed to beckon my attention, saying, Hey, over here, there's plenty of us to go around. The smell would drift across the yard like a lazy fly in early summer providing me some solace through my early trial and error days in the garden. Honeysuckle and other fragrant spring and summer flowers have many uses, but are particularly well suited for infusion into spirits, liqueurs, and cordials, as well as to use as garnishes. Garnishes are often a forgotten cost in the creation of a cocktail, and while edible flowers are available from plenty of purveyors, it can be difficult to obtain flowers with their potent aromas still intact. When picked fresh, the honeysuckle flowers retains its unmistakable aroma and adds a floral complexity to any drink simply by sitting on top of it. It can also be a memorable flower for so many people as it's often the first taste any of us ever had of the wild natural world. I found that a lot of people connect with it and have fond stories of tasting that first drop of nectar when they were kids. It's hard to put a price on that type of sensory connection a guest can have with one drink. To keep honeysuckle fresh for garnish at the peak of its season, follow these guidelines. Be sure to harvest in an area that has not been sprayed with pesticides. Try to harvest honeysuckle in mid-morning before the temperature is too hot outside. Using garden shears or a good sharp pocket knife, cut off honeysuckle vines in 12 to 18 inch lengths, plunging the branches into 4 to 6 inches of ice water as soon after cutting as you can. Leave the flowers on the vines. Honeysuckle is classified as invasive, so don't worry, it'll grow back with a plum. Harvesting vines with blossoms that haven't fully opened yet can give you the opportunity to use the blossoms right after they've bloomed. If you pass by your favorite honeysuckle spot and notice that the blooms are gone, wait until a good rain has fallen in the area, then go back and see if the blooms have returned. With periodic heavy rain, honeysuckle can hang around all summer and deep into fall. Making your own honeysuckle liqueur is very easy, and I use a honeysuckle vodka to add another layer of that delicate floral flavor. This honeysuckle vodka from Cathead Distillery in Mississippi is available in 16 states as of this printing, but if you can't find it where you live, see if your local liquor store can order it. One thing you may be surprised at is how much honeysuckle it takes for the flavor to shine through. Now, I mentioned that when making your own honeysuckle liqueur, which... Let me get into that recipe. The book goes on to go into elderflower a little bit, which I think, though this is the flower episode, we'll have to come back to elderflower. I think we might have to do a whole episode about it. So the honeysuckle liqueur from the book, you've got two quarts of sugar, one quart water, one quart lightly packed honeysuckle blossoms washed under cold water and patted dry, two cups cathead honeysuckle vodka, the zest and juice of two lemons, half a cup of fresh chamomile flowers or a quarter cup dried chamomile, two drops orange blossom water. 
So you cook the sugar and water over low heat to dissolve the sugar, then promptly remove from heat. Add the honeysuckle, vodka, lemon zest, and juice, chamomile, along with the orange blossom water. Refrigerate for three days to allow the flavors to infuse, then strain out the solids and bottle. The liqueur will keep in the refrigerator for months. To make this a cordial, simply take out the vodka, but note that the cordial will only keep for around a month in the refrigerator without that vodka to fortify it. So honeysuckle liqueur, super easy to make and a lot of fun to infuse with. And at this time, we're going to turn things over to... Booze News with Kenneth Dead Garden Tea. All right, Kenneth, what do you got for us this week, buddy? Thanks, Mike. I miss you, buddy. This is Booze News from Quarantine. I'm Kenneth Dedman. Our first story starts with some badass Hebrews and some Kentucky bourbon distillers. Yes. Oh, my gosh. All right, so Buffalo Trace has partnered with the Chicago Rabbinical Council to create a purpose-driven kosher bourbon and rye whiskey, all weighing in at 47% alcohol. Two bourbon expressions will be made limit in limited amounts available, um, one being a weeder and the other being a high rye expression with, of course, a rye expression, a rye whiskey expression offered as well. Apparently, Buffalo Trace has been working on this project for about 10 years, but uh, there is no age statement on these on these bourbons or whiskeys. You can maybe ballpark it, I guess. Uh, now, I understand why make kosher whiskey. Um, most whiskeys are kosher anyway. Most spirits are kosher anyway. Um, if a business wants to make a quality product, typically... Typically, their distilled spirit is going to fall into the lines of uh, the the strict guidelines of of kosher products. Uh, in Buffalo Trace's case, I imagine that they were just like overly meticulous in the cleaning of their utensils, their bottling line, their barrels, and you know, like it's not really that big of a business boom or loss for them um, to add the kosher to add kosher to their label. Uh, it doesn't really cost anything because it's still on the three colorway print that they're doing. So if you're adding words, it's not it's not really going to cost anything. And um, if if you know much about kosher standards, it really just means that you have a uh, clean cleaner product. I mean, this beats the FDA by a few thousand years as far as as far as quality standards. So yeah, that's a fun one. Finally, in environmental booze news this week, meant to quell your concerns for Mother Earth, drip irrigation is on the rise. Spelled D-R-I-P, drip. This ancient practice places water directly in the root zone, ideally achieving maximum absorption with minimal evaporation. Drip irrigation dates as far back as 1st century BC China, with a resurgence in the 19th century in Germany, was perfected and patented in the 1950s in Israel. Perfect for winemaking, since vines do not require as much water as other crops. However, due to climate change, irrigation is a constant, constant challenge for many wine growers. Mexico City-based Orbia Agriculture is a merging force in the sustainable practice. They're getting desired results using digital monitors and sensors along with reusing wastewater. Reusing wastewater, yeah. Fetzer Vineyards in Mendocino, California has begun testing a Chilean invention called Biofiltro, which uses live earthworms to filter wastewater and make it usable for crops. Pretty cool shit. This is Booze News. Y'all keep your chins up. Later, Tater. All right, thanks so much to Kenneth Dedman filing his Booze News reports out there in Texas. And want to thank Jess Matchin for all her beautiful artwork and the new Garden Teen logo. Everyone over at We Own This Town, weownthistown.net. Producer Michael Eads, thank you, Michael. Thanks to everybody for listening and writing in to liquidgoldpod at gmail.com, liquidgold underscore pod on Instagram. 
My name's Mike Wolf. You can find me at Mike Wolf underscore Garden to Glass on Instagram. My book, Garden to Glass, Grow Your Drinks from the Ground Up, available at bookshop.org. I've got that link in my bio on Instagram. Find Kenneth at deadmonk, D-E-D-M-O-N-K, Deadman K, on Instagram. And interact with us. It's great to hear from everybody. Seems like we are maybe seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, but could also be a little too soon to to talk about any of that. So we're going to be spending plenty of time in the garden talking about it. If you have any questions or a topic that you want us to talk about on the show, if we didn't get to it this week, we'll get to it next time. Turns out we had a lot to get to today with flowers, as well as this will be an ongoing thing as we plant seeds in the garden, watch them grow. And I'm sure in a future episode, we're going to talk about all these problems we're having because those are right around the corner. There's always something that's going to come up in the garden. Thanks again for listening right here on Liquid Gold. We will see you. Happy planting. Get some sunshine out there. Get some fresh air and say hello to the bees and the butterflies for us. Cheers, everybody.